In the year 1160, Japan's two greatest clans fought a war of annihilation. The leader of the Taira clan gathered his soldiers to hunt down his bitter rival, the Minamoto. Few of the Minamoto survived not even their chief. His young sons, Yoritomo and Yoshitsune, escaped. They swore to take up the sword and avenge their father. They would follow the path of honor or death, the way of the samurai. There is a way of bringing up the child of a samurai. From the time of infancy, one should encourage bravery. If a person is affected by cowardice, as a child, it remains a lifetime scar. The boys Yoritomo and Yoshitsune were born into a samurai family and a way of life ruled by honor. For the boys, the shame of living under the same sky as the man who killed their father was too much to bear. They were bound to seek vengeance. They would follow Bushido, the way of the warrior. The samurai were a class apart, professional warriors born to fight. The very word means to serve. A samurai placed himself in the care of a lord. In return, the warrior pledged to his master his life. Obeying orders without pause, he would know no other life than to train and fight for the leader of his clan. Being a retainer is nothing other than being a supporter of one's lord entrusting matters of good and evil to him, and renouncing self-interest. Only 6% of the Japanese were samurai, and they intermarried to maintain their privileged stock. Over the centuries, from bands of landowning warriors scattered across Japan, the clans of samurai evolved. Yoritomo and Yoshitsune were born into the powerful clan of the Minamoto. By the 12th century, many clans had become great armies and mortal rivals. Japan was at ceaseless war with itself. Yoritomo and Yoshitsune began to learn the way of the samurai. The warrior's closest ally was his horse. The boys first learned to master it. Once they rode with confidence, the younger Yoshitsune was placed in the care of a master who taught him archery. The samurai bow was sturdily made of strips of bamboo bound with rattan. Six to seven feet long, it was held one-third up from the base, so it could be easily maneuvered. Yoshitsune marveled as his elder brother and the other young samurai combined the skills they had learned. Destined to lead the Minamoto, 
the brothers were now separated for their safety and sent away to finish their training for war. Samurai were trained in the arts of sojutsu and naginata, the long spear and the halberd. But the ultimate skill of the samurai was Kenjutsu, the art of swordsmanship. The samurai valued his sword above all else, so much that in time it became the symbol of his soul. craftsman was more esteemed than the swordsman. His profession was more religion than craft. He dressed like a priest and purified himself before purifying his steel. A hard steel sheath encased the softer core, making the sword stronger yet more flexible than any of its day. The blade would be beaten, ground, and polished to the sharpest edge known to man. Every swing of the sledge, every plunge into water, every friction on the grindstone was a religious act. The samurai carried his sword in a finely lacquered scabbard. When he drew the brilliantly polished blade, light shone in waves all along it. Its cold blade, collecting on its surface the moment it is drawn the vapors of the atmosphere. Its immaculate texture, flashing light of bluish hue. Its matchless edge upon which histories and possibilities hang. It was made to kill a man with one blow. Then, with a flick of the wrist, the warrior would shake off the blood of his enemy. The young samurai would learn where a man was weakest. A cut to the side of the throat would sever the jugular and kill within three or four seconds. A slash to the wrists, kidneys, or armpit a little longer. The samurai's life was like the cherry blossoms, beautiful and brief. For him, as for the flower, death followed naturally gloriously. The way of the samurai is found in death. Every day when one's body and mind are at peace, one should meditate upon being ripped apart by arrows, spears and swords. And every day without fail, one should consider himself as dead. No samurai sought death, but all trained to accept it and numbed their hearts to fear. Before battle, the samurai prayed. Through the secret rituals of Buddhism, he entered a state of divine strength. It is said that on the battlefield, if he wills himself and day and night hopes to strike down a powerful enemy, he will grow indefatigable and fierce of heart and will manifest his courage. Hey. 
Yoshitsune's page dressed him for battle. His elegant armor was strong yet light, made of overlapping strips of iron, lacquered for protection against rain, and bound with bright silken cords so he could move freely. He wore iron shin guards and arm guards and bearskin boots. His head was protected by an iron-plated helmet bearing an elaborate neck guard. For nearly two decades, Yoshitsune had trained for the chance to avenge his father. Now, once again, the Taira and the Minamoto would clash. Both sides followed the strict rituals of samurai warfare. The riders charged by turns and vied to announce their names. Their shouts and yells awoke echoes in the mountains. I am Kajiwara Heizo, a Minamoto warrior worth a thousand men. If anyone here considers himself my equal, let him kill me and display my head to his chief. After a day of bloody fighting, the Tyra retreated to their boats. Fastening a fan to a mast, they taunted the Minamoto to strike it with a single arrow. Yoshitsune summoned a young warrior famed for his archery. The honor of the clan was in the young samurai's hands. He rode out into the rough sea and closed his eyes in silent prayer. Hail, great Bodhisattva Hachiman, and the gods of my province. Vouchsafe that I may hit the center of that fan. If I miss, I will smash my bow and kill myself. In answer to his prayers, the sea grew calm. All watched in silence. He notched his arrow and steadied his breathing. Then he took aim and fired. The arrow flew straight to the fan, thudded into it and cut it loose. For a time, the fan fluttered in the air. Then it fell abruptly towards the sea. As it floated on the waves, the skill of the samurai was honored by loud cheers from both armies. For five years, the fighting between the clans wore on. In 1184, Yoshitsune reached a Taira stronghold and a turning point. At Ichinotani, he launched his most daring assault. Dominating the shoreline, backed by a treacherous cliff, the fortress was thought invincible. With a handful of trusted men, Yoshitsune rode up to the outcrop overlooking the castle. Far below them, the sound of a flute drifted up on the wind. The Tyra suspected nothing. Some listened to the music, a passion of this cultured clan. Others passed the time by playing an ancient board game, Go. From his vantage, Yoshitsune decided to test the precipitous route by sending riderless horses down the cliff.
Some of the horses broke their legs and fell. Others descended in safety. Three of them reached the roof and stood there, trembling. Where horses alone could go, Yoshitsune decided, so could riders. Now the renowned horsemanship of his men would be put to the test. He galloped forward at the head of 30 horsemen, and all the others followed, descending a slope so steep that the rear rider's stirrups touched the front rider's helmets. The tense riders went down with their eyes closed, encouraging their horses in muffled voices. Yoshitsune signaled his warriors down by the shore, the wealthy mounted on horseback, the others on foot. They launched their attack. From the rear, Yoshitsune and 30 riders stormed into the castle. The Taira warriors turned to face the real danger. Too late. They raised a great battle cry, and great numbers of panic-stricken Tyra warriors galloped into the sea to save themselves. A Minamoto warrior by the name of Nozone gave chase. He saw a lone rider splash into the sea. Nazane rode up alongside him, gripped with all his strength, crashed with him to the ground. He pushed aside his helmet to cut off his head. He was 16 years old, a boy, just the age of Nazane's own son. Tucked into his belt, was a flute. This was the boy who just hours before had played so sweetly. I would spare you, he said, holding back his tears. For there are Minamoto warriors everywhere. You cannot escape. It is better if I kill you than another, for I will offer prayers for you. Tears pouring from his eyes, Nazone steeled himself and sliced off the boy's head with one clean blow. After battle, each samurai gathered his trophies, the heads of the vanquished. Their faces were washed, their hair combed, and their heads laid out with labels naming both slain and slayer, so the lord of the clan could inspect them. Those who brought back the heads of renowned enemies were lavished with titles and estates for their valor. Months after the victory at Ichinotani, the Taira clan was finally crushed. 24 years after their father's murder, the brothers had their revenge. Yoritomo, the leader of the victorious Minamoto, was raised to Shogun, supreme military ruler of Japan. For his brother, Yoshitsune, the joy of victory was cut short. His bravery in battle had made him popular and made the Shogun jealous. Yoritomo issued his own brother's death warrant. Since boyhood, every warrior was prepared for the final self-sacrifice, a ritual permitted to no one but a samurai, seppuku. Through it, a warrior could atone for an act of disgrace. Yoshitsune sought only to preserve his honor. Better to die by one's own sword 
than be hunted down like an animal. There is but one resolute path for the warrior to take. It is that of death. Yoshitsune's page brought him a last drink of sake. Then he presented him with a short sword, its blade wrapped in silk to soak up his blood. For a moment, he seemed to collect his thoughts for the last time. And then, stabbing himself deeply below the waist on the left side, he drew the dirk slowly across to the right side, and turning it in the wound, gave a slight cut upwards. He never moved a muscle on his face. He uttered no sound. In the 13th century, the samurai embraced a strand of Buddhism known as Zen. Like all Buddhism, Zen forbade the taking of life. Yet many samurai were drawn to it, for it took them to another world. For warriors daily facing death, Zen was a comforting faith. Many samurai who survived into old age became Buddhist monks. As late as 1867, Japan would be ruled by samurai families. Yet the seeds of their decline were sown long before. In the middle of the 16th century, Portuguese traders introduced the nemesis of the samurai, firearms. In 1575 at Nagashino Castle, the Takeda clan for the first time braved musket fire. The gun proved mightier than the sword. Thousands of samurai were slain. That day, the rituals of samurai warfare were shattered. The classical age of the warrior was dead. The sound of the Gion Shoja bells echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the Sala flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. The proud do not endure. They are like a dream on a spring night. The mighty fall at last. They are as dust before the wind. <laughs> 